I bring you greetings in the blessed name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I really want to thank God for this opportunity to be able to share the gospel with you before I return tonight to my country. The title of our message this morning is Questions About Eternity. Text is taken from Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 to 26. Matthew 19, verse 16 to 26. Let us read this passage responsively. I shall begin, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. In unison, last verse. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? A gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that this morning once again we can be able to listen to the gospel from the word of God. We thank you, O Lord, that you have brought us together in this time of worship, in this time of meditation of your word. And so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will impress these gospel truths in our hearts and that there may be conviction of sins and repentance and faith unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we also, Lord, may realize the frailty and uncertainty of life here on earth. And for us who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that these truths of the gospel may be established and even strengthened in our hearts, may be reinforced, that will truly keep us strong and steadfast in the faith until the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That we may not live in the vanities of this world, that we may pull all our strength our time, our efforts, and our resources unto the coming of the Lord and establish His kingdom here on earth. That our life and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ may bear eternal dividends to the glory of God. This is our prayer, O Lord. We pray this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I was told that we are still in the Chinese New Year period. Is it true? I think it's true. And so let me also take this opportunity to greet all of you. Sinian Kuala. Blessed New Year to each one of you. And every New Year that passes by will indeed be blessed when we have the assurance 
of what lies ahead of us. It is blessed if we can be sure of where we will be heading in the future. But it can never be blessed, it can even be miserable, if there is no certainty and if we haven't settled our eternal future and we don't really know where we will be like say five or ten years from now we know that nothing is really certain in this world and we don't even know for sure what tomorrow will be Well, some can be very presumptuous about their life's destiny, but it doesn't change anything, and it doesn't really mean anything. Now, there was a man, a Spaniard, named Salvador Dali. He was a genius and a painter. And in the 80s, he once said, quote, I'm going to live forever. And the reason he gave is that geniuses don't die. Well, he died in 1989. But there is some truth to his statement, I'm going to live forever. But the question is, where? Where will you be spending your time forever? Will your last breath here on earth be your first breath in heaven? Or will it be in hell? The Bible says there is an eternity. One that is in heaven and another that is in the lake of fire in hell. And so this is a question about eternity, isn't it? But which side of eternity? Is it eternal life or is it eternal death? Will we be living in heavenly mansions or will we be swimming in the lake of fire? Now this is a very important question every one of us must face. And if there is one statistical data about human beings that has been 100% accurate, it is this, that 10 out of 10 people will die. Okay? 100 out of 100, 1,000 of 1,000, a million of million, whatever the figure is, it's 100% sure and certain. So the reality is that one day, all of us will have to go. And so the question of eternity must cross our minds if it hasn't already. Now, whether rich or poor or young or old, the powerful, the oppressed, we all will have to deal with this eventuality. And so as we meditate on our passage this morning, we will come across three questions about eternity that was asked. And these questions are applicable to us, you know, for we really need to settle these questions in our hearts, personally, individually. Now, our texts have parallel passages that can be found in, other, in the other synoptic Gospels. You know, in, the, in the Gospel of Mark, it is in chapter 10, from verse 17. In the Gospel of Luke, it begins in the 18th verse, the 18th chapter and it all talks about a person which came to Jesus with a question about eternity and so if you will collate all the data about this person from the other synoptic Gospels we will know that this was a rich young ruler and this question about eternity came across his mind now here was a person who had everything. Well, almost everything. He was rich, he was wealthy, he was young, and of course in his youth he was full of vigor and full of strength. 
And since he was a ruler, no doubt he should be powerful, influential. He had almost everything, but he desired one more thing. And so he came to Jesus asking this very good question. Now strangely though, this question came back with a surprising answer. It was a good question with a strange answer. So we see here in verse 16 when this rich young ruler came to Jesus, he said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And so the Lord responded and replied, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now we have a crisis here, isn't it? Because it seems like Jesus is denying that he is God. And in fact, this verse has often been used by cults and those who deny the deity of Christ to prove their beliefs. And so is Jesus telling us here that he is not God and that he is not good? Of course not. So how, how do we explain this? Well, we all know that Christ is omniscient, isn't it? And he can see through the hearts and minds of men. And he knew that this rich young ruler thought of him as just a mere man and not God. And this we know because we can read later in that passage that this ruler did not believe in Jesus when he refused to part with his possessions and he refused to follow him. And so here we see Jesus giving a, some kind of a rhetorical answer according to this man's perspective of him. It was like a rebuke from Jesus, saying him, to him, like, you know, if you regard me as just an ordinary man, a mere man, then you should not call me good, because only God is good. But if you look at me as God, then you can call me good. And so with this answer, Jesus was exposing this young ruler's unbelief. And the young ruler did not believe that Jesus himself is God. Now if you will look at a parallel passage in Mark chapter 10. If you will turn there. Mark chapter 10. In verse 17, you will see there in, in that passage, or in that verse. That this young ruler, okay, is, he also came to Jesus. And he came there in verse 17, running and even kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now we, we can say that he, he worshipped Jesus in a way and may even have idolized him. Maybe because he heard about the miracle healings and the feeding of the thousands, you know, how, how f powerful this person is. And he was, maybe he was thinking he can make me even more rich, more influential, more powerful. And certainly not because that Jesus is God. And so we see him saying to Jesus in verse 17, Good master. Okay? And so when... Jesus rebuked him about, you know, only God is good. And look at verse 20 of that passage. How the rich young ruler answered. Verse 20, and he answered and said unto him, Master. The adjective is gone. There was no more good in his master. So he came to Jesus. He was running. He was very excited. But later in that verse, in verse 22, we see that he went away grieved. For he could not part with his riches and follow Christ. And so we can now plainly see that his wealth, after all, was his God. He worshipped not a person, but a possession. 
He was rich, but he was not born again. And he did not trust in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And so he would rather trust his worldly goods. You know? Why should I part with it? So here is a man so materially wealthy, yet so deep in spiritual poverty. So Jesus exposed not only his unbelief, also exposed his true desire. It was not really eternal life. It was more of material wealth. And he wanted more. And you know, this is the great danger of people who want to be rich in this world, but not rich towards God. That's why Jesus later on said in that passage, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Of course, it does not say that the rich cannot enter into the kingdom of God, but that it might be difficult if you are. So if we are rich, we must invest our riches in the kingdom of God. And then we will have laid up for ourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust doth not corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. One reality of riches is that it lifts up our standards of living. And the higher the living standards go up, the greater also will be the tendency for the spiritual standard to go down. This is very, very true, isn't it? You know, we can just imagine how many of those, like say, who play golf on Sundays, you know, how many of them could have been found here in church worshiping the Lord when they could not have afforded that, 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 to play that game? When our pockets are full, we are less prayerful. Thus the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy. If you turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. From verse 17 there. Bible says, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us all who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold. On eternal life so you see the real rich person is one who is rich in good works and ready to obey what the Lord Jesus Christ wants them to do you know Satan can can use if you will look at uh, the earlier verse there in chapter 6 of, our, of the passage in verse 10 you can see there that Satan can also use the deceitfulness of riches and to lure us into many foolish and hurtful lusts and drown us into perdition. So in verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now do take note that money itself is not the one that is evil. It is us. You know, when we develop an obsession for it, love for it, that is the root of all evil. Now, if we are poor, we must, we must not fret. It's not the lack of money. Okay? It's not the lack of money that is the root of all evil. The love of money. But there's also a danger here that our lack of money may result into our, our love and, longer, and longing and a lust and an obsession for it. So you see, it does not mean that being poor would be any easier. And that is why King Solomon wrote in the Proverbs, 
Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and, so, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Proverbs 30 verses 8 and 9. I remember when I was teaching at the Bible College of East Africa some years ago, one of my students asked me a question. And he said, you know, why did Judas have to betray the Lord for just 30 pieces of silver when he already had that money bag to himself? Well, in answer to that question, I just pointed him to this verse in 1 Timothy 6.10. The love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, how Judas loved money. He was gripped and obsessed for money. So it is like being sucked into an endless vacuum. No satisfaction at all. That's the philosophy of greed. What is mine is mine alone. But what is yours can also be mine. And I will find a way. Find a way to get it. No, money is good. As a servant, it will serve us well if we employ it well. But it is a terrible master and even an abominable God. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. But this young ruler, he was already rich, and so he chose to serve mammon. He chose to serve his possessions. He became enslaved to it. And we can see later that he went away. He went away very sad. And the Bible tells us, for he had great possessions, you know, in verse 22 of, of our text. You go back there. Matthew 19, 19 verse 22, but when the young man heard that saying, okay, after he heard how Jesus told him to sell all his possessions and come and follow Jesus, he heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So we realize that being rich does not necessarily mean very happy. And we might suppose that it could have been in order if the verse had read, and we, he went away very happy, for he had get great, great possessions. know here that the opposite is true and spiritual poverty can be a consequence of material wealth so if there's one thing in this world that we really need to possess and to truly make us rich it is faith in Christ now turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 and the Apostle Paul stated it this way Colossians 1, 27. There he said, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What it is, what, what it is which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul here is saying, If I have Christ, I have enough. You know, all things come from Him. But if I don't have Christ, all things will be worthless. For all these things will perish together with me one day. So do you have Christ in you? Is He your hope of glory? If your answer is yes, then you are truly rich. You are an heir 
to eternal riches in heaven. Riches that will never be corrupted, never fade away. You know, the problem of earthly riches is that we might get so enamored with it, you know, and it will cause us not to, to long after heaven. You know, forget about heaven. It's too, too far away. I want to enjoy my life here. You know? Material wealth can make our life here so comfortable and it will deceive us. You know, deceive us not to really you know, long after heaven. It will deceive us to really cling on to what we have here on earth. So instead of praying, even so, come Lord Jesus, or thy kingdom come, we end up saying, no, please don't come now, <laughs> maybe later. Lah. So my life's still so comfortable, now. new condo, new car. Yeah, I still want to tour and go, go around the world. So such was the case of this rich young ruler. And his riches gave him a luxurious life. Made him influential, made him powerful. But certainly it cannot make him stay young forever. He failed to realize that his material wealth can never hold off his death. And sooner or later this question it will haunt him all over again. What must I do to have eternal life? But nevertheless, it was a good question to ask, even for an unbeliever like this rich young ruler. What shall I do that I may have eternal life? You see, he desired to live forever. Is it possible? Can we live forever? Well, the good news is that the Bible says, yes, it is. And the only way to fulfill that desire is to receive Christ as our Lord and our Savior. The perfect sacrifice. And in believing that we may be born again as a child of God. That's what we have read in our responsive reading earlier. You must be born again, Jesus said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you still have not found everlasting life then you really need to seriously consider this question. What must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus' answer is very simple. You must be born again. You must believe in him. You must accept him. You must receive him and embrace him as the Lord and Savior of your life. Now going back to this question of eternity. Uh, no doubt it was a good question. But the next point that I want to make here is that this question had a wrong presupposition. Now, if you will read that verse again, where the rich young ruler asked, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, is there really some good thing that man can do in order to get to heaven? Well, we will let the Bible answered this question. Turn to Psalm 14. Psalm 14. We see here the Word of God answering that question whether we can really do something with our own strength, our own hands. Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. 
they are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not even one. And Isaiah 64 verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So the answer is no. We can never do anything. You know, except for biblical Christianity, all religions in the world will always tell you to do something. To gain merit or to gain entrance to heaven. And these prescribe good works. You know, they vary from you know, horrendous to some, something that is really absurd. You know, some radical religions may prescribe terrorism you know, and uh, holy war, so to speak. And others also need to pay for this, pay for that, do this and do that, and it will increase your chances getting to heaven. And the absurd include such things as drinking cow urine, you know. Drink cow urine, you, you increase your chances to go to heaven. You see, without the Bible, man, if left to his own imaginations, we are totally hopeless. And we can invent all sorts of ways, according to our finite mind, all sorts of inventions and devices that we think can get us to heaven. But the Bible says clearly, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Why? It is the gift of God. You know, genuine Christianity will never tell us to earn our salvation by doing good works or, or maybe paying for some merits. The Lord Jesus did it all for us on the cross at Calvary. He came down to earth and lived a perfect life and fulfilled the Ten Commandments perfectly for our sake. This is one thing that we can never do. Every day, we continue to transgress against God in our thoughts, in our words, in our conduct. And so Jesus must come. And Jesus must fulfill the law for us. Because we are powerless to do it. And so when Jesus hung on that cross dying in John chapter 19 verse 30 and as he breathed his last he declared it is finished it is done and the perfect work of man's redemption was fulfilled by Christ himself and we can never really add anything more to it to say that we can work for something to increase our chances is to outrightly deny the perfection of his redemptive work. And you know, ever since in the Old Testament, in the, you know, when the people started building the Tower of Babylon, and even now, you know, scientists uh, have always been trying to devise something to, you know, reach heaven. And uh, they do space explorations to maybe we can discover heaven out there one day. So man has always been trying and striving hard to reach heaven by his own efforts. But you know, if it is really upon us to do something in order to get to heaven, then Jesus says in our passage, why not try doing this? Okay? Look at that verse, verse 17. Going back to Matthew chapter 19. Okay, verse 17, the, the second part here. And he said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And then he said, But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Okay? You really think you can do something? Here it is. Jesus himself prescribed it. 
But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And note the plural, plural here, commandments, not just one, two, but all. And it means to keep them all perfectly. And you don't break any one at any time, just even once. If you do, one strike, you're out. I don't think any one of us here have done that. If Christ would not have come, we're all very, very sure about eternity, isn't it? It will be in the lake of fire. There will be no sacrifice. There will be no forgiveness of sins. There will be no atonement. But to this young ruler, he answered very boastfully, you know. Look at verse 20. He said in verse 20, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? All these things have I kept from my youth up. Really? Now, this man was not only arrogant, he was also a liar, isn't it? And to prove his lie, Jesus was like saying to him, Okay, since you are saying that, now take this. Read verse 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But what happened afterwards? Verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He had great possessions in this world, but not the great salvation in Christ. And he forsook that offer of salvation in eternal life for the comforts of his possession in this temporal life. And so by turning away from Christ and refusing to obey him, we can see that he broke commandment number one. He has another God. His money, his wealth, his possession. He also broke commandment number 10. He was covetous. And we might as well include all the commandments in between. For sure he has transgressed it. So do we see a reflection of the rich young ruler in his attitude towards possessions and money? Do we see a reflection of him in our hearts? You know, in the parallel passage in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, Jesus answered him this way. Jesus said, One thing thou lackest. One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. One thing thou lackest. And it's not a small thing. It means everything. Because in the end, it can mean all things or nothing at all. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? So what good thing shall I do? Or what good thing shall you do to have eternal life? Now, this is a terribly wrong presupposition. And that Satan offer whispers into our ears. You can do something. Yeah, you're, you're quite good, you know. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 will give us the correct presupposition. Romans 3, from verse 10 to verse 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And why? Why is that? Continue in verse 23, below. It tells us why. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody can ever plead innocence before God. 
You ha- we all have fallen short. We all have sinned. And our sins have rendered us helpless and powerless to work for our salvation. And that's why our, our good works are as filthy rags, as the prophet Isaiah said. So there is nothing good that we really can do, isn't it? And that is why Christ has to come. And Christ came to do the work of our salvation. And he came to keep the commandments perfectly for us. Because we simply cannot do it. Helpless. He paid a ransom for our sins, which is death. And it cost him his precious lifeblood. Jesus did it all. Jesus paid it all. And so we have looked at a good question with a strange answer. And we have known that this good question had a faulty presupposition. Now going further, as we go back to Matthew 19, going further down in verse 25, another question was raised here. Okay? And this time, it was a good question, a correct question, with the right presupposition. And he got the right answer from the Lord. Look at verse 25. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? Now, this certainly was the right question to ask. So the disciples here, the disciples were, were realizing the futility of good works. And they were described in this verse as exceedingly amazed. In the Gospel of Mark, it is translated as astonished out of measure. So they were very surprised. They were very um, amazingly, you know, thinking of salvation as something that is really beyond man, unfathomable. And so this sincere question from the disciples, of course, can only get a sincere answer from the Lord. And so in verse 26, the answer came, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And here is the good news, brothers and sisters. And that was what the prophet Jonah, Jonah declared many, many years ago when he said, Salvation is of the Lord, not of us, not of any things or possessions that we can have. The Lord Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, very familiar verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So this question can only have one correct answer. With God. And knowing Jesus to be God, it's possible. We just have to believe in Him. That Jesus is the only way to God. He is the truth of God. He is the life from God. And because He is the Son of God, no man can really go through the Father, but through Him, and only in Him and by Him. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, this is how the Apostle Paul stated it. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Confess with thy mouth, believe in thine heart. It's not just a profession, but also a possession. It is a possession not of a thing, but it is a possession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that verse continues, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So who then can be saved? 
Well, definitely with human power, no one. Impossible. That's what Jesus said. But with the power of the grace of God in Christ Jesus, nothing, nothing is impossible. Christ is the way to God because Christ is God. As simple as that. Now I'd like to quote that genius again, Salvador Dali, that I told you about earlier. He said, I'm going to live forever. If indeed we can be able to live on earth forever, I don't think any one of us here will you know, desire for it anyway. You know, even if you could be very rich, and very powerful, or even if you would be a genius like, like Salvador Dali. Why? Why do I say that? Well, just imagine you're very intelligent. You're very rich, powerful. But you are already a very old, say, 100 or 200, 200 years old. And day by day, you do nothing but sit blind in a wheelchair. And you just drift in and out of consciousness. You know, somebody has to feed you. Somebody has to wash you and clothe you. And you will not even be able to enjoy your riches anymore. And most likely, you know, your own family would have been fighting over it anyway. <laughs> you cannot touch it. And this adds up to your woes and miseries. And so in your vegetable condition, someone has to, you know, do all things for you. And you will be in this situation for the next hundred years, or the next thousand years, or if you will, forever. Why or not? I'm sure no one wants to be living like this life forever. And we're not even talking about hell. It's even more terrible down there. A fire that can never be quenched, will the wor where the worms dieth not, and the suffering will be eternal. The torment will be, will be everlasting. So as long as the world continues to turn, as the Lord carries, we thank God that we are given a chance to change our eternal destination. If we believe in the gospel and be born again, yes, we are on our way to heaven. And it's a place where we are given glorified bodies, bodies that will never decay, Bodies that are everlasting. You will know no sickness, no death. You know, last Thursday when Pastor went to the care ministry, he was preaching there. And he asked our brother Eng Xiu, you know, Brother Eng Xiu, he's suffering from cancer. And he has been very weak and afflicted. So he asked him, Will you still be happy even if the Lord will not heal you? And to which a brother Engshu replied, Yes. He said yes because he knows his sins are forgiven and he believes in God's promise of eternal life in heaven. A life where there will be no sorrow, no crying, no pain. He's in a lot of pain right now. And I'm even inclined to think that he longs after heaven. Longing it to the extent of saying, please come Lord Jesus right now that I may be relieved of my suffering. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Very familiar verse to all of us. And I hope that it doesn't become all too familiar that we may miss out on that important ingredient 
on the important content. Faith in Christ. Believe in Christ. Receive Him as your Lord and personal Savior. And then you will have a blessed eternity in heaven. And then you will have settled the correct answer to this question about eternity. You know, each passing day is one day closer to our eternal destination. And so we must really make sure that we are heading to the right one. <laughs>